everyone and welcome to the first ever episode of Transracial Adoption, Positive or Negative. My name is Sinu Viola, I'm a Chinese adoptee, born in China, raised in London and now currently living in Lisbon. And this is my co-host, my mother, Elizabeth. Hello, I'm Elizabeth. I am a single adopter with two adult Chinese children. Simru is the eldest and I have a 23-year-old. In this podcast, we want to talk about the positives and negatives of adopting transracially and talk about our own personal experiences along the way. This is our first time doing a podcast, so we hope there are no technical difficulties and you can hear us okay, but hopefully in future episodes, they can always be ironed out. We decided to start this podcast because I'm quite open about being a Chinese adoptee on my own platforms and quite a lot of my audience were very interested to hear more about adoption and more about my own personal story. What I noticed was that there weren't really many resources or other content available online where you heard not just from the adoptee and their perspective, but also from the parent. So I proposed this idea to mum since we're quite open and talk quite a lot about adoption. And uh, she agreed to come on this podcast and to, to start one with me. So that is essentially why we decided to start it. And we hope that any of you listeners uh, will, will find the topics interesting, um, even those who, who aren't necessarily in the adoption sphere. So a brief overview of what we're hoping to cover in the next few podcasts. Next time, we will look at the preparation groups and the um, process of applying for adoption. Obviously, that was just me because I, I hadn't adopted any child at that stage. Second episode, we thought we would um, talk about me going to China to adopt Simru, how she reacted, what it was like for her coming back to England. She was too young to remember, but um, we have a lot of information and and we can discuss it uh, in retrospect. And then after that, we'll do episodes about my second adoption of my other daughter, how they reacted to each other and to their schools and lives in England, how they felt about it all their experiences growing up and then leaving home. One of the other reasons why we're starting the podcast at this point is that Simru is waiting to hear about an exciting trip when she's going back to China for a year. Yes, we are still waiting. I think I'm on day eight of waiting since I returned back to the UK from from Lisbon and with all of my things. I am planning to go to China for the next academic year to study Mandarin for a whole year. Um, I've been back to China about 11 or 12 times before, so quite a lot of times. I've been learning Mandarin on and off since the age of three, but I've always wanted to go back to spend a solid year and a long period of time formally learning, learning the language. So that is what I'm doing. We are still yet of when I will actually be making the trip because I'm still waiting for my university to send me my documents so I can apply for my visa and find out all about the quarantine restrictions and rules at the moment. Um, But hopefully by the time you're listening to this podcast, um, I will not only be out of quarantine, but I will be in in China, hopefully. So we're going to be doing the podcast from two different countries, um, Britain and China. And I don't know yet whether it would be possible for me to go and visit China Um, during that time because at the moment uh, you have to do a long quarantine if you go there for any reason at all (laughs) and mum doesn't want to be in quarantine no definitely not (laughs) so I will be so to give just a brief background and overview of our own lives uh, before delving into this first episode um, I thought I would just give a give a quick summary so mum obviously applied to adopt me and we can get into the nitty-gritty of that in in the next episode and she adopted me when I was one in 1998 And then I came back uh, with her to England and then we went when I was three to adopt my younger sister and I also went with her and then we came back and we all grew up in London. Then my sister and I went to to school and then on to university. But then after university, I I moved to Lisbon where I now live and my sister now lives in the Midlands. Yeah, that's just a very, very quick, brief overview of our lives. So for the rest of the episode, we thought we would just talk about a few issues around adoption that might be of interest in we yeah yeah I have a lots of questions that I'm actually intrigued by myself to ask to ask my mum um so the first one being mum why did you decide to adopt from China as a single parent well I'd always thought about well I thought I'd like to have children that hadn't happened I was about 40 I had talked to someone I knew about domestic adoption that really wasn't feasible at the time and there's always a great shortage of very small children or babies Mm. in any case domestically as everybody knows Um, but I I was you know too old I had to work because I had no private money 
And I was single, so that was all against me, really, with domestic adoption. I think it'd be easier now. Really? But Even being single as a domestic adop- adopter, I don't think that that would, would be a hindrance, like, I think domestic, they, domestically. Yeah, I was told that if you... That my only chance would be probably um, a girl who couldn't be in a household where there was a man. That would be my only chance, probably a teenage girl. I didn't feel I really wanted to do that, whereas I knew there might be other options. But I'd really given up on the idea of adoption. And then somebody I knew at work was telling me that one of their colleagues at their born-again Christian church, who already had three small children, was, for religious reasons, going to adopt um, internationally from China. I was amazed because I had seen um, television programmes, first of all about India, about how there was um, a process in some very, very poor areas whereby girl children who they couldn't afford to um, keep um, died under unfortunate circumstances. And the same possibly was implied in China. There was this programme called The Dying Rooms, which I didn't watch, but I understood that it was about how in some children's homes in China... Um, allegedly babies were almost allowed to die in an artificial sense uh, when they could have been saved. Now China would probably contradict that, so one doesn't absolutely know the truth of it, but that was the reputation of it at the time. Um, So I didn't even watch those programmes because I thought, oh, I could have taken one of those children. I just thought it was sad, but there was nothing could happen. And then I heard, to my astonishment, given the closed nature of China at the time, that China allowed international adoption. I was absolutely amazed. So I asked this woman to find out about it, which she did. She gave me a tape of the dying rooms and that had um, the uh, contact details at the end. And I followed it all up, um, to cut a long story short. And it was possible they accepted older parents, single parents. um, And so I applied to adopt from China, yeah, because there was no real um, feasible alternative anywhere else. Very few countries accept singles, very few. So you hadn't even really thought about adopting internationally before you heard about this other woman doing it? No, not at all. Absolutely not, no. And it was only programmes like the one about India and the one about the dining rooms in China that made me think, well, why not? Um, it wouldn't have occurred to me otherwise, I don't think. So why, after you did hear of, of those, why just go for China and not another country? Is it just because you knew someone going for China? or? Um... I knew that there was a genuine need in China. I think there's always a worry, especially with um, international adoption, that maybe you're taking a child where there might have been some trafficking involved or whether the only reason the parents couldn't keep the child was terrible poverty. And I felt if I knew that to be the case, it would be very, very hard to take the child, knowing that if the parents were given the money, they could have, the birth parents could have kept the child. I just thought there was a genuine need because... There were so many children's homes in China with lots and lots of babies, mostly girls, who were never going to be adopted. And I thought, well, it's got to be better to have one parent and maybe even to go to another country than to have to stay under those circumstances. So I, it was the genuineness of the need, I think, hmm. really. And what was the process and how long did it take? Well, it's interesting that um, UK social workers are very much, always have been very much against transracial adoption and against international adoption. Um, we can talk more about their reasons. Yeah, I, I find that surprising. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I say, we can talk more about the reasons, but because of their negativity, the councils in London generally would not do home studies. In other words, wouldn't do the approval process for international adoption. And they would never have done transracial adoption domestically. If they had had a black or Asian child, they would never have given them to a white family. That was the policy at the time. I think it's eased off a bit now. And I I do understand their reasons, and we can talk about that another Mm. time. But um, there was an agency called Childlink, so they referred me to that. So, yeah, there was a lot of negativity from social workers. It was quite difficult. You had to be quite determined to do it. Um, But, yeah, so I was... um, assessed then the papers went um, to the British authorities and on to the Chinese authorities in Beijing so the whole process took about um, two and a bit years between my application and when I adopted you and that was typical at the time years later it became you know seven years Mm. or something you know ridiculous really so the the process was relatively straightforward when I did it to be honest oh really that also kind of surprises me wasn't stressful or difficult um, no, not really. Um, I think everyone finds being assessed stressful intrinsically, but no, I think I had an easy time compared with all the people later on. 
And compared with some who had much more confrontational social workers, I had a very nice social worker who was very fair. So I didn't mind seeing her when she used to come round for our sessions. I, I quite enjoyed our talks, actually. And did you know that you always wanted a second child? I thought at first I would only adopt one because that seemed like such a huge hurdle to um, go over. But in in principle, yes, I would always have preferred to have two. I think because I grew up in a family with two children, I regarded that as normal, which I think a lot of people do. They always go back to their own experiences as a child. And the home study takes big account of that. They expect that everyone's whole parenting style will be dictated rather by how they were treated and what their experiences as a child. So that's really quite an interesting assumption. Um, so I, I, I thought it would be wonderful to have a second, but I wasn't sure how possible that would be until I'd got you and I knew I could cope. And I thought then, yes, I, I could cope with another child. I totally underestimated how much harder it is with two than one. You know, you've given up your whole life and changed everything to accommodate one child. And you just think, well, if I'm getting another child who's only a couple of years younger, how much harder can it be? Um, but it is a lot harder, a lot harder. Um, so I'm glad I had to, <laughs> but I think I was, yeah, it was much harder getting number two than it was getting number one, definitely. And when you wanted to get a second child, did you only think about China or did you think about other countries too? No, no, certainly not. Once I'd got one Chinese child, the only way I would ever have adopted a second child would have been to give you a sibling who was also Chinese. That wasn't my main motivation. Obviously, my main motivation was that I liked the idea of having a second child. But, yeah, I, I felt it had to be from China. And it had gone OK, you know. There have been no major hiccups for me with the first adoption at all. So I didn't... I wasn't as nervous as I might have been if, if things had been difficult. Another question that really interests me and quite a few of my friends or people I meet nowadays ask as well is that you were a, a single parent by choice. So how did other people react to that and how did you find it? Um, especially going to China back in those days. You know, I mean, had, had you gone to China before? I mean, not many people had ventured that far. So, mm -hmm. yeah, tell us a bit about that. Yes, I had been to China on holiday on one occasion. Why? Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I like travelling. <laughs> I like travelling, I fancied going to... Yeah, China must have been China. so different. It was like, amazing. We can, if you want to, when we talk about your China trip, we can talk about what it was like when I went there. It's like a different world, different from China now. Yeah, you can Absolutely. imagine. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I had been to China, and um, single parent by choice. Well, I'd reached 40 and had not had the opportunity to have children by any other method. So I uh, decided that adoption would be good but domestically there really wasn't any option of adoption for me at that time probably less so then than now certainly for small children they were looking for couples fairly young and I was over 40 remember um, where one usually the mother would stay at home and look after the child that was the ideal that they were looking for really so that's not what they I said it's for house well, they call house mums, housewives. Yeah, it didn't have to be the mother, but it usually it is, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, some one of the parents staying at home with the child. Really? Yeah. Would you say that's because of the way times were back then, and it would be different now, yeah. or they still look for that now? It might be different now, but I think they felt that a child who'd been traumatized by their background needed uh, yeah. stability, and they needed a lot of attention. I mean, I understand mm. their point of view, really. Um, China didn't take that view. In China at that time, and probably largely now, it was absolutely assumed that a mother, as soon as she'd had their one child, would go to work. So they totally accepted adopters who worked because that was the norm in China. So that was great for mm. me that they took that view. Um, so some people were quite negative because they are negative about single parents. And then they would say things which really annoyed me, like, oh, well, I don't, you know, don't really approve of single parents, but you're different. I didn't like that yeah. at all. I always regarded myself as a single parent like anyone else. Um, so I didn't like all that. You probably get that with other things as well, don't you? People say, oh, well, I don't like immigrants, but that doesn't mean you. Oh, I don't like this, but that doesn't mean you. It's a normal thing that you do hear on all sorts of things. So um, some people were a little bit concerned that I wouldn't m manage very well. So literally a few weeks or months before I finally got to China to adopt you. I noticed there was a flurry of activity amongst my friends at work trying to suggest um, 
oh, perhaps you could go out with this man or perhaps you could marry that man. Or... Really? <laughs> well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but they all seem desperate to find me a man as if I couldn't manage on my own, as if, you, well, you don't realise how hard this is going to be. How how far in advance was this before you were going to fly out? Oh, well, it was you know a few months or so. Really? Well, I'm not saying they really thought I was... You know, yeah. But they, they did all want to try and find me someone, they did think. And a lot of the men, nice though they usually were, I think felt that it was a really tough and unsatisfactory situation when a woman brought up a child on her own I think a man understandably wants to feel that he's needed in the lives of his children and therefore that if a child only has a mother that that's not great so some of the men I think found it harder to accept that I was doing an okay thing than the women some of the women um, it's quite funny the number of women who'd come up and whisper to me at work I think you're doing exactly the right thing. I wish I'd done that. We don't need men, do we? I've literally got that from several people. Um, often women who'd had their babies quite young, and I just think they thought, oh, perhaps I would be better on my own. Yeah, it's quite funny. <laughs> so how was it for you being the child of a single-parent family? I don't think... I really remember how I thought about it as a child, because... People have asked me that in my adulthood as well, and I can't really say that it impacted me a lot or that I noticed it a huge amount as a child, but I think that I must have done. You know, as children, you kind of notice everything. You notice mm. when you stand out, when you're a bit different. And I think I must have noticed at school or when I first started that, oh, I don't have a dad, and people asking, where's your dad? It must, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a common question that was asked to me, but I can say now it, those types of things don't, don't affect me and I don't really feel any different but that's because I've never known what it would have been like to have had a dad so I can't really miss what I don't what I don't know or what I've never had I think because I've grown up as you say with a single mum who's done everything I realise that well <laughs> what do we need the men, <laughs> the men for <laughs> because mum's done it herself so you know I, I don't really feel as though we we missed out on anything I think maybe growing up now and reflecting and thinking about my childhood I think more that yes I've obviously missed out on having that relationship with a man an older man in my yeah. life but it's not I don't I don't personally see it as having hindered me in any way um if anything it's probably made me more strong and independent and resilient um but obviously I, I have missed out on that on that important relationship that other people have around me although interestingly a lot of my very 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 close friends my closest friends um were all brought up in single parent households so perhaps it does make a difference if you single them out. Yeah, unconsciously though, because I don't, mm. I don't know, I don't discover that they are also from single parent households until you know much further down the line. So well, there is a lot of it about. Yeah, yeah, well. there is a lot as well. But it, I, I found that interesting. I only in the past year connected the dots and thought, oh, most of my best friends are also from single parent households, which I did find very interesting. Yeah. And whether that does have an effect, you know, subconsciously so being brought up in the same mm. sort of environment. Yeah. Um, most of them are, are were brought up by, by mothers rather than fathers. One, one example of negativity from someone I liked, um, they, they present, they, people often present you with these bits of information and you think, why would you say that to me? And this was that girls brought up in single parent families often become obsessed with men and go chasing round after all sorts of different men because they haven't had a father. And I remember being told this when you two were very young and whilst I tried to push it to one side, you know, if you're a worrier like me, you sort of think, oh gosh, I wonder if that's true. Hasn't been, though. No, but Hasn't I also think that that can be true even if you do have a father figure. What if you have a father figure and the father figure is just, you know, more absent or not really invested in the children? I think that could also happen. Mm. This person obviously thought statistically that that's what happened, but it certainly hasn't happened in my case. No. So that was, um, you sort of think, why would anyone say that to me, given that I'd got two children as a single parent? People say these negative things and it's, yeah, it does feel a bit odd. But I think the thing that stood out more to me as a child is probably that you were a much older parent um, <laughs> than most of my other friends and everyone else at school. Their, their mums weren't as old as you. I think that was definitely something that stuck with me more. I just think you remember one time we were in Tesco in the supermarket uh, and I was just helping you pack away all the shopping and the cashier smiled at me and said, oh, you're helping grandma, aren't you? <laughs> I, just, I think that, yeah, just the whole general feeling that you were seen as my grandma by a lot of people or that you, you, you were much older 
that that kind of was very embarrassing for me as a child like really really embarrassing I know I felt embarrassed sometimes but I think it was because of where we lived which was in a working class area where people get married younger and an immigrant area where a lot of the immigrant communities get married really very much younger than most white middle class areas such as the place where I grew up and where grandma lived where you would normally expect people to get married in their 30s have children 35 maybe even later I mean my sister had one nearly 40 in which case you could not have been my grandchild but because of where we lived most of your friends I mean and one of Ching Ching's friends her mother had her first baby at 17 I mean it's just amazing so that's why I felt embarrassed about being an older mother it was because of the nature of the area we were in and it was it was awkward in that respect wasn't it yeah because you were considerably older than most people um well, like most other children that we came across and you had grey hair and mm. every time like, most people would just assume you were our grandma why didn't you tell me to dye it we well, probably did at the time <laughs> and you probably refused um, yeah. but um, yeah that's something that stuck with me more than not having a father I would say mm. I think I remember that um, one of your friends or Ching Ching's friends said they'd seen me at your enormously large secondary school one day and I said well how did they know it was me and you said Oh, everybody knows we have the old white mum. <laughs> so I've always remembered that. I'm the old white mum. But you can tell there weren't many white people at the old school when no. they say that. <laughs> but the old, old though, old being the yes. <laughs> standout yes. word. But well. some people never, in spite of all of that, some people did assume I was your birth mother, didn't they? On many occasions. Did they? Yeah. Oh, as a child? Mm. I don't remember. I remember it now as a grown adult. Yeah. People don't really question it, but... And I think that's one of the advantages of being a single parent, that there was never a white father present to make it obvious that you were adopted. It was much more that um, you were always around with just me. And I, I mean, I could have been your birth mother, but women have babies later than I was the year you were born. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. But I think also, aside from the fact I know I keep going on that mum was a lot older when I was a child, than my friends' mums. I also did have other adoptee friends who I grew up with who also had older parents. So I think I knew that, that it didn't make us so different. It was just on a day-to-day basis. Like at school, you were the only parent. You were probably the oldest parent there. I can't remember, really. I think you probably were. Yeah, it's yeah. quite possible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. A lot of the, gra- the were grandmothers who were younger than me, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. In the Asian community, some of the grandmothers were younger than me. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, so, was it an advantage then having friends? Because we we were a member of various adoption groups, weren't we? Transracial adoption groups and summer schools and all the rest of it. Was it an advantage to you that you had friends in a similar position? Yeah, I I think I think when I was a child, I didn't necessarily see it as an advantage. But now, having grown up, I do see it as an advantage. Having had, having been surrounded by other transracially adopted children. Um, some of them are my closest friends even today some of them are my best friends today and I'm very grateful to have them in my life but specifically growing up with them I grew up with them ever since I was like the first time I was adopted like my oldest friend Eloise she's still in my life now we're really close and I've known her ever since I was a ever since I was one really I do I do think it's advantageous just because you have that shared connection and that shared experience and although as children we never really spoke about being adopted besides the obvious, that our parents don't look like us and, oh, we come from China and all of that kind of stuff, it was nice just knowing other families who were like us, knowing that there were other children who also had parents and families who didn't look like them and who were also from the same, well, at least in my case, you know, I've got, I've got transracially adopted friends from, from other countries, but I, a lot of them are also from China. So knowing other Chinese children was really nice who weren't mm. were just like me they'd come from China but we'd grown up in England and our, our families were British and white and that was uh, I think probably very comforting as a child having that and not feeling so isolated and alone in it and uh, as you said having having a my younger sister Ching Ching as well definitely helped I think with my feeling of identity because I saw every day my younger sister who was also Chinese but yeah having having friends definitely has been um really really great uh, and I'm very grateful for them because growing up uh, now uh, in the, the years where you're really starting to reflect and think about your identity and how you belong in this world and just thinking more about who you are as a person, 
I'd say from your late teens to your early 20s um, and throughout university, if that's that, that's where you go. Having the, those friends there who are also adopted and have gone through and are going through very similar things to me, it's been really, really good because I felt as though I can speak to them very openly about the emotions that I feel and the things I'm going through without having to really explain in detail about what I mean or trying to make them understand in some way because they just get it. And it's very different from when I speak to my other close friends who aren't adopted. And there are lots of different topics that I don't talk to uh, with anyone who isn't adopted because those who are adopted just understand it instantly. They just get it. I don't have to explain. I don't have to do anything or say anything else because they just they just get it and they're going through very similar experiences and emotions and feelings and thoughts so I'm very grateful yeah to, to have that support network it is really important I think because as I say there are some things that I don't feel comfortable enough talking about with other non-adoptees because no matter how hard I try they will never fully fully understand and do you think I would ever understand your situation as a as an adoptee from China I think as an adopted parent and you being the person who's brought me up and I've seen the efforts and lengths you've gone to to ensure that I've maintained a connection with China and you've been very aware and conscious of all of the issues that can arise from being adopted and mm -hmm. you're very aware of the trauma that's there and so, as we say some of the negatives um, that, that arise from it but I do think objectively you will not ever be able to understand what it's like as, no. as an adoptee. I think conceptually people can definitely conceptually and and, and you, you take great interest and you want to understand. So I think conceptually, someone who isn't adopted, if they really want to try and understand, they can. But it's always only at a conceptual level that you'll never truly be able to understand it because you, you, you have not gone through that. And you have, you have been someone who has grown up in your, in, in, with your birth family, with people who look like you in the same environment. You will never know what it's like no. not to know anyone else who's not biologically related to you. No. You see, a lot of people who have lots of biological family sort of think oh it doesn't matter don't they they think it doesn't matter especially if they don't get on with some of their members of their family they just think why would I care but and it is hard as you say you can believe people that it matters but you can't feel it mm. yeah in a way yeah that's why when I talk about adoption openly on my um on my platforms and even to friends who aren't adopted I do recommend watching the show this is us um, streamed by HBO and it's on Amazon Prime in the UK now I think it follows a whole family and covers a lot of range of issues but one in mm -hmm. particular it's one of the good. characters yeah called Randall he's um, a black adoptee he's adopted by this white family um, and they do cover a lot of his adoption issues um, and it's the first show that I've really truly felt seen in uh, and I was actually interviewed recently about this by the Metro uh, about my my thoughts about the show because it's the first TV show that really covers adoption and covers the negative connotations with it as well and really covers the adoptee experience as a, as a major um, storyline and component of the show. And if you watch the show and you, you watch some of the episodes where they really focus in on Randall's story, the emotions that the show evokes, the way it tells the story is, is very, very accurate, I would say. Yeah. Um, and it, Very it, interesting. Very interesting. And I think it's, it's one way that non-adoptees can try and understand how we feel and the what we go through because it really highlights that although Randall in the show he's a black man he's in his 40s and he's still struggling with his identity with being adopted and that is kind of the pinnacle of what adoption is that for adoptees we will always be going through this journey and it's going to be a lifelong journey and we do have these issues and these struggles that aren't really spoken about or even known about or acknowledged in society because adoption is so often seen as something so positive Whereas this show is really showing, no, you, they do struggle. And although, yes, they've got this new life and they've been very lucky and fortunate in some senses, they've also had a lot of loss. And I think the show really does do a good job of highlighting that to the wider audience um, of people who might not even be aware that adoption can be difficult and, and can be a struggle for those who are adopted. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, actually. It was good. It was really good. Yeah. The parents were lovely, the children were nice, and yet there were still struggles. Yeah, still struggles, so, exactly. Yeah, so I think that's kind of all we have time for for, the, for our first episode. We yeah. hope it's been a really interesting introduction for those of you who are listening, if, if anyone is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, in ne the next episode, what are we going to cover? The preparations for adoption. But we'll always be talking about lots of different issues, won't we? I think it's um, an opportunity to go into some of the things that, even that we've mentioned today in a bit more depth and talk about the significance of, of all these issues, really. Yeah. 
hopefully see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. Bye. Bye.